Good evening, welcome, and thanks for coming to this event tonight. Um, I'm Bob Russell, founder and director of the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences here at uh, GTU. And um, just a word about our program. Uh, CNES sponsors the creative mutual inter interaction between theology and science in an inter ecumenical and interfaith context. Uh, we do through programs of research, teaching, and public service. Tonight's public forum is that public service part, bring some of the work that we've done or are in the process of doing uh, to the wider public. And I'm so delighted to have you here and be part of the presentation. Um, I'll introduce our speaker in a minute, but let me just say first, the format will be very simple. Uh, she'll speak for probably 45, 50 minutes, then we'll have Q&A, and I encourage you to write your questions in the chats and we'll try to get to them. We'll probably be done about 6.20, 6.30, uh, and that, kind of that, that direction. So let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Carolyn Frusch is a MDiv student at Church Divinity School of Pacific, which is a, here one of the seminaries at the GTU. She holds a PhD in physics from the University of Bern, Switzerland. Uh, she holds the rank of associate professor at the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue University, where her field of research is space debris and space domain awareness, focusing on human-made objects. And her um, presentation tonight is titled Dimensions of Time. I'm delighted to have Carolyn with us. She's one of the few people I know who has a PhD in physics and is pursuing an MDiv in, in theology. So welcome and congratulations, Carolyn. We look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much for the um, introduction, Bob, and also for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm reasonably nervous because this is also a new field I'm stepping into and I'm just starting out as a, as a beginner here. Um, during my talk, I will um, share slides sometimes when the illustration is necessary and then there will times when there will, no, will be no slides shared. And yeah, please don't be shy to put your um, questions at any point in the chat. <clears throat> so what I'm talking today about is dimensions of time. And of course, that is a play with words already um, in bringing dimensionality and time together. What I mean by that is that we have time in different systems in which we are, um, in which we are progressing and in which we are um, finding ourselves in. So, and I want to start with um, taking a look at kind of three different systems, which are not necessarily distinct. And um, I will share a bit of nomenclature um, here. So for the terminology, I want to talk about the Christian divine time. That would be the time of the Christian God. Please note that I'm um, only focusing on, on, the, on the Christian understanding of God because um, a fact that's often overlooked is that um, very different theologies have a very different notion of um, time. And then um, the second one is what I want to call measured time. That's usually the time we associate by being measured by a clock. That would be the time that's used in science and engineering. And here I also want to make the first kind of restriction of the problem. I'm not going to focus on the um, early universe, kind of the start of time. I'm not going to focus on the end times, kind of um, what happens there. I want to focus on kind of the, the middle mellow time we're, we're in at the, at the moment. And then the third one is what I call ontological time. That's connected to the time in terms of the human mode of existence. And you already see that's not... 100% um, distinct from the um, measured time as um, I think all of you have a, a clock on their cell phone or we're wearing a, a watch at the moment. Um, but time has a, a role in ontology and there I want to focus um, on um, kind of the outline Heidegger ha has brought um, into philosophy and then fold that back into how that relates to Pannenberg. Um, the, the underlying assumption is here that all three systems are inspired and connected to reality as a, as a phenomenon and that we are experiencing and then in science and it's kind of measured and then in Christian theology that would be kind of uh, revelation and tradition and that are different attempts of a description of it and um, 
ultimately the um, we only have the phenomenon and the noumenon is inaccessible. So that's kind of the assumption here. What I don't want to do is, namely this, you have this notion of that kind of signs and faiths would kind of neatly fit together like the puzzle here. And um, uh, there's a very good book by um, Joshua Moritz, for example, that kind of uh, already shows that that, that that is not something that will ever work. It's not something that's um, uh, a distinction between science and theology that um, is strong in the history. So um, if you're expecting that, you will be thoroughly disappointed. What I want to do instead is um, I want to just look at time and see see it from different angles in those different, uh, in those three different systems and then see, okay, if we do make a bit of a comparison, do we get some synergies? Do we learn a bit more than when we're um, looking at time and each one of those systems completely different, separate? Okay, <clears throat> so I want to start with a few preliminaries. And then once those preliminaries are established, then dive into the main part of the talk. The preliminaries I want to start with, and you talk about measured time, that already brings up the question, well, how do we measure time? If you're going back in history, time traditionally has been measured by celestial phenomenons where we say, okay, we have the day, and we have um, um, the lunar circles with kind of a consist, uh, consistent month, and then the yearly um, circle, um, which would be our Earth time. Um, as we approve, and this has already been by, by the uh, early high cultures, like the, the Mayas or something, where we see those observations of the solstices, where in order to time things and find, find the year and then break it, break it down in different subsections. Um, this has actually been going on for, for a long time and up to uh, 1955 we used the, the tropical year, kind of uh, um, a recurrence of, of the solstice um, in a bit more precise way where we said okay we are fixing that to 1900 because we have, because the earth is actually a bit wobbly and um, the timescales are not as precise as we would like them and say okay this is our timescale and then we break that down into um, the SI unit of a second. Um, however it really turns out that the, that the celestial motion is not regular enough. We already have Tutu Bois, um, one of the earliest astronomers of modern times um, or the medieval times kind of in the Western world kind of complaining that his clock is always kind of a few seconds off. So, um, so as we think the celestial phenomena are so regular, that's actually a deception. And if you look into the details there, nowadays we are dealing with leap seconds and so on. So um, since uh, 1967, we are defining the second base on the, on the cesium-133 atom and its ground states, zero Kelvin at mean sea level, and um, take like 9,192,631,770 periods of that in order to define our, our um, second. Okay, that, that's a lot of numbers, but just to, to bring that, that when we're saying we're measuring time, we're using a system of change in order to, um, to give some periodic time where we say, okay, that is what is defining um, one time unit. And then from multiples of that time unit, we're getting to the time instances. And as the rotation of the earth is actually slowing down, um, we have things like leap seconds. So, and that creates already kind of a distinction point to um, early considerations of what is the um, divine where we had something that's unchanging. If we're looking at the, at the Gloria Patri, for example, when we say et nunc, et semper, et in secular secularum, uh, in different translations now and always, not in the ages of ages, or from everlasting and forever and ever, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Um, or now forever and to the ages of ages we're seeing, this is um, talking about a contrast to, to that um, change model and going back to the Greeks as early as Parmenides, there has been uh, this notion that the divine is kind of, or that there is a being within, without beginning and end, unmoving and eternal, and then with uh, Origin and Plotinus, that, that God, some of those 
got transferred to the to the triune Christian God. And um, so in these, there may be attributes, there may be part of the essence of God. That's uh, uh, another uh, debate has been um, discussed in, in the Christian tradition where we discriminate um, kind of uh, timelessness and the everlasting. Everlasting is sometimes also called the semi eternal. Um, we talk about the semi eternal, that is something that outlasts everything that's coming into being and is, is vanishing. So um, kind of extended time, um, following a timeline from past, present to future, but kind of spreading into the infinite uh, in both directions that will be in time. Um, that doesn't mean God would be necessarily bound to actually only can move along that timeline. If we go to Swinburne, for example, um, there is also an element of freedom of God, even when God is, would be in time to kind of move relative to that. Um, not going into the details here, there's also the notion of timelessness, comes in two strands, absolute and relative timelessness, um, where um, the being itself participates in um, either duration or non-durational, and um, the absolute timelessness would be supported by Plotinus and then becomes um, um, influential in Boethius, Anselm, Aquinas, and so on, and um, describing God as, as complete and ever-present. Um, <clears throat> and as such, uh, absolute timelessness would not be um, participating in a, in a form um, of past or futurity um, in that sense. In more modern debates, we're talking about um, temporal co-presence, co and interestingly enough, some of the um, newer theologians, such as Schwebel, is actually going into that eternal motion. So kind of abolishing that um, non-moving part, but saying, okay, maybe there's an eternal motion, which can also constitute God. And of course, you can explore uh, with the Christian God, the Trinity, and say, okay, what are different parts and how do they relate um, to time? This is a whole big debate. I just wanted to, to mention that, that um, it's not that we can say, oh, in theology, there's this one notion of, of divine time, and that's what we are dealing with. But there, there's um, a, a large internal, even within theology, debate on how we understand time and is different notions of eternal or uh, semi eternal, how that is an attribute or even the essence of, of the divine um, nature. What I want to mention here is independent of which flavor of eternity or semi eternal you're going for, this is connected to kind of um, questions of um, predestination or foreknowledge. Kind of, if God is kind of ahead in time or holds, holds the key to time, then does God know um, what's going to happen next for me, which is later in, in my time? So that's kind of the, the realm in which we are, in which we are um, operating. And um, that already shows even within theology, the notion of time is intimately connected to the notion of causality. Okay. So those would be my preliminaries. I don't expect that you um, memorized everything, but I just wanted to mention, okay, that's kind of the ground we are, we are standing on. This is how we, on the one hand, measure time, and that's kind of a bit of a glimpse into the time discussion in um, theology. Okay. Having gotten the preliminaries out of the way, let's jump into, okay, if we're saying time and that notion of change, how can we approach that? And I have been looking around a bit and said, okay, why don't we um, start with something very um, ancient, which would be actually um, one of Zeno's paradoxes, which is kind of well known, and I chose the, the arrow paradox. So, Zeno's paradoxes, as, as um, Aristotle reports them, are um, kind of well known. And the underlying question here is, how can an arrow 
be moving in space from one point to another if at each instant of time the arrow is still and is not moving? It's kind of a question, okay, if we have kind of a movie and we have the different, different frames, how can that lead ever to motion? And that, that's kind of paraphrasing and you see on the slide um, kind of how, how it's translated from Aristotle's physics. Um, that the flying arrow is at rest, which, uh, which result follows from the assumption that time is composed of moments. So it's each moment the arrow is at rest, as you see on the right, T1, T2, T3, and T4, and so on. Um, and then Zeno says, allegedly, uh, that if everything, when it occupies an equal space, is at rest, and if that, which is in locomotion, is always in a now, the flying arrow is therefore motionless. So that will be kind of proving, so to speak, that motion is not um, possible. And that of course also has an effect on time. If there's no motion, how do we even um, account for, for time in that sense? Um, interestingly enough, um, there are enough sources that say that Zeno's paradox is not even really solved in philosophy nowadays. Of course, there are attempts at it. I think the most um, well-known one would be uh, Russell's ad ad theory, what it's often called, um, where he said, okay, at T0, we have that arrow at the, at the left of point Q, at T1, it's kind of at the right of point Q, and the tip is at the location X here, at T2, it is with the tip at the point Y. Hence, when it is at those different times, that's well as the at at theory at those locations, then it must have moved. Um, that, that's how Russell goes about it. And there are enough of them, of, of his opponents, so to speak, that say, well, that's basically a tautology that he creates. He's not explaining anything, basically. So, um, and I think that's a fair objection here. So, the interesting part is while I think there's a wide agreement in philosophy that that paradox is not really sufficiently solved, it is actually not a problem to calculate that, the motion of the arrow, even for, I don't know, an undergrad or a high school student, if you're, if you're in all honesty. So, and that is also not debated why, why we haven't resolved the, the um, the paradox, it's also not a debate that we have solved that mathematically kind of in science and engineering that we can calculate that even though we haven't proven that the motion is actually philosophically possible. So, uh, and how can, how do we do that? And um, I know you're losing about 10% of your uh, listeners each time you show a formula. I brought a couple of them, nevertheless. I do uh, promise um, you don't you don't need them. It's just an illustration um, if if you're um, keen on on having a clear representation. So, how do we compute that with the error that's actually um, due to the infinitesimal um, that was first kind of more widely explored by by Leibniz and Newton? Um, there are precursors to that in other other cultures. Um, it's what we now call calculus. And then um, that would, was later kind of more formalized and finally proven through the uh, cauchy weierstrass epsilon delta definition of a limit. Don't worry about it. But the, the kicker is here that we define kind of a derivative here. Usually we say the df dt t would be time as a limit. Here we have that delta t thing in the bottom and then say delta t is going to zero. Kind of the time difference is going to to zero, we're really making an infinitesimal time point, which actually directly relates back to um, Zeno's um, paradox there. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, here, Newton called that a change is a variable quantity over time. Leibniz says changes the difference ranging over a sequence of infinitely close values. So even at the time when that was more formally introduced, the, the interpretation of that widely varied even between um, Leibniz and Newton, although they ended up with the same um, mathematical concept for it. So what does that mean? You maybe know that from um, school, kind of the, the derivatives, kind of that, that slope, and that would be kind of intimately tied to, okay, where is the arrow at a given time and at 
what is the, the rate of change that is associated with that, which actually makes us able to compute um, that motion. So what that allows us to do is actually getting a directionality in the flow of time from past, present, future, if we are talking about the measured time. You probably remember Newton's law. Um, uh, but, but what that does is, and that's why I brought that, um, that video here from Getty Images, we see, okay, there is the, the diver and she's jumping and then falling down into the water. And as I'm going forward in that video, you know intuitively, and also we know that from the science that that is the flow of time. If I start jumping up, we know the direction of gravity, it's going down. We know that is the time. And then each instance in that video, each frame, for example, would be the present for an infinitely more small amount of time. And as we are living, we're going from past, present, future, and that's how, how it's also computed. And you also know, if I'm going back words in the video, that I can compute that, same as I can play the video backwards, but you know that is backwards. The causality did not return, uh, did not reverse. I can reverse kind of the, the, the time and say, okay, this is forward, forward, going down, this would be upward, but as we know how the forces are acting and what the causality is, her jumping up and being up causes her to go down and not being down causes her to go up. Um, we're, actually, we're actually knowing that ordering of time, past, present, future here. And that is, that is integral in kind of the, the Newtonian um, mechanics that, that we are looking at here. So the question then becomes, not stopping, the sharing here. Okay, that all makes sense kind of in our natural experience of the world and kind of the Newtonian mechanics. But we also know, fortunate or not, Newtonian mechanics is not, um, not an adequate description of the realities in all regimes. <clears throat> so one regime to look at would be, of course, um, general and special relativity. We know clocks that are moving are actually slower. And that, that is a, not just a fake thing, that's a real thing. That's kind of like the time passes slower if you're moving fast enough. That's kind of the, the twin example, kind of um, with, with the two twins, uh, astronauts, one moving fast, one, one stays on the ground. They are aging differently. And um, what does that mean for our causality then. So is that still valid if we are talking about flow of time in general and special relativity? So what then is often kind of shown is these, these kind of cones of light, and I was stealing that from, from Eucla and, and Röhrlich, where we say I have this kind of a space time diagram and we see the light cone that's the speed of light and we know in general and special relativity nothing can be faster than the speed of light and that's also the um the speed at which we can transfer um information so and then inside this cone here we have the the past where we can look back and we have the, the future where the time flows and then within that cone causality is preserved. It's kind of when we are doing the time travel kind of back into the future when causality would be um, violated. And that's why kind of in back in the future, um, you could prevent your own birth, for example, and then everything uh, gets out of whack. So that would be outside the cone. And that's actually where we cannot travel if we're not um, faster than the speed of light, which doesn't seem to be um, possible. So with that being said, that um, flow of time in terms of causality is even preserved under general and special relativity. What is not preserved when we are talking relativity is what is synchronous and what is not synchronous. If I'm in a um, 
one coordinate frame, event A can come after event um, B, whereas in a, another coordinate frame, potentially a moving one relative to that one, the two events could be simultaneously. What cannot happen, even under special relativity, is the reverse, that I am in a coordinate frame where B is first and then causing, causing A. That causal relation cannot be, um, cannot be uh, uh, vulnerated. So even in um, special and general relativity, the two events that are timely separated can maximally coincide. That, of course, would speak against kind of a um, uh, block universe and these things, but um, it's not necessary to go into that. It's just a notion that our understanding of time is a lot more fluid than um, actually that, that rigid timeline, but not to an extent that it's arbitrary. <clears throat> the other um, scientific theory that's often brought into um, into the conversation of um, uh, seemingly questioning causality is kind of chaos. However, chaos is very simple in a sense. Chaos happens even in the, in the Newtonian uh, world. It just means I do not know enough. If I knew the exact initial conditions, I could follow the uh, line of causality and actually predict um, the end state. What we have the problem with weather, for example, is that we would have to have a weather station every um, every three feet, basically, to collect enough data to actually predict the weather um, uh, into the future um, precise enough. Um, so as weather is a very chaotic system, the timeline or um, the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent is very short, over which we can predict the weather if I'm just locally having one measure. Uh, one weather station or just a couple of weather stations um, spread over the US, for example. So that is just a question of knowledge. I have uncertainty to begin with, and then um, that uncertainty can just grow. <clears throat> the third scientific theory that's often brought also in the conversation is, of course, quantum level, quantum field theory. Everything seems to be possible on the quantum level. However, there I want to say there are different quantum interpretations. There's a Copenhagen interpretation, which is famous and um, but seems to be losing track. But there's also the ensemble um, interpretation, for example, ensemble theory or de Broglie, for example. Um, I just want to make a few points on the uh, quantum theory. If we are looking at a single quantum system, I will be not able to say what is the outcome when I do a next measurement. And some, of, some people call that indeterminism. That would be the Copenhagen um, interpretation. However, if I have 100 systems, I can predict accurately that, for example, 40% are going to do A and 60% are going to do B. That would be the ensemble interpretation. If I go for a statistical um, interpretation, I can actually make predictions that are um, then are valid for a single system. I can just say, okay, it's going to be toss up 60, 40, for example, that's going to be state A or state, state B. Um, in my personal opinion, that doesn't really um, allow indeterminism. It also does not give a lot of wiggle room for kind of um, uh, violation of causality. If you want to go into a reverse causality, we would go all the way with uh, the Broglie interpretation and kind of Sutherland on that, um, which at the moment is, is not um, confirmed or uh, validated. So we will have to wait a bit longer to see what, what's the outcome there. Okay, so the, the takeaway message that I have on the, um, on the measured system is, okay, we do this infinitesimal step kind of from Newton and Leibniz. Um, we can kind of chop up time into infinitesimal pieces that allows us the ability to compute and actually predict 
um, motion that holds in Newtonian mechanics, that holds in general and special relativity. There are a few extra terms that come in. Special and general relativity may render, depending on my speed, um, certain events simultaneous, like at the same time, which are in other systems at a distinct time, T1, event A, T2, event B, but it doesn't fundamentally change the the flow in the sense that um, I have a causality. If T, if event A causes event B, they can maximally simul be simultaneous. This holds um, also um, in, in chaotic systems, which are not fundamentally different. And in um, quantum field theory, I could, if I wanted, break that down onto an ensemble. I might have problems with a single system, but if I say, okay, I reproduce the same system a hundred times, I can statistically say what's happened and statistically I have um, causality preserved there. <clears throat> okay, so that of course explains one part of the problem. Okay, time seems to have, if I'm talking about scientific time and measure time, it seems to have the ability that I can chop it down in kind of infinitely more small pieces. But what happens with the opposite? Like I'm going infinitely small, but does that mean I can kind of extend the timeline into infinity as well? Again, from the interpretive point here, if you're thinking about uh, Zeno's paradox and kind of um, arguing that through um, philosophically, um, that's actually a challenge. If we're going back to math, it's actually very easy and our undergrads can do that. So um, I want to show that, and that's my penultimate formula that I'm going to show. So um, if we're talking measure time and time as a total, when we're going here in the limit t to infinity, um, we actually have something that's called the finite value theorem, and it's kind of super nifty. So what you're seeing is, I can go in the time domain to infinity, and that's the same as if I'm in the frequency domain going to zero. Okay, don't worry about the details here. The relevant thing is, you have seen that one before. It was a t to zero, but you have seen the limit when you can't chop something into kind of infinitesimal pieces before. And kind of in math, if you can do that in one domain, then you can project that, uh, or then that is equivalent to having the reverse, namely going to infinity in the connected domain. And you can do that via Laplace transform, but that's the, the transformation is not relevant here. The thing is from, from the math point of view, from the applied math, as you're having the limit going to zero already established with Leibniz and Newton, you're basically getting the right for free that you can also expand that to infinity. That's just what, what, the, what the system allows you to do. And that's kind of pretty cool. Um, doesn't solve the philosophical problem, but it shows again, you can actually easily compute that. And then you have to figure out what that actually means. Okay. <clears throat> so that would be kind of the background on, okay, what does, what does measured time say? And we will come back to um, the science and the um, engineering actually in a little bit. But having that established kind of measured time, that it's kind of a, a rate of change, that um, you have your timeline, past, present, future, um, that it holds into different in different descriptions in different domains, kind of the fast domain with kind of relativity, the normal domain, Newton, which we live in, the particle domain to a certain extent on the on the quantum level, and how that is also connected, like in theology, with uh, the timeline and the causality. I want to actually then look at okay, if you stop here and look at what are we doing on kind of the human level? And that brings us to ontology. Of course, you can have your pick of your favorite philosopher on um, what, what describes the, the human being or what, what is special about the being of a human. And 
I'm also making a pick here, not uh, wanting to suppress that there are many opinions on the matter out here, of course, but I'm taking um, one of the, I would say most influential philosophers in modern time on ontology, and that would be um, Heidegger's view. Uh, just as a note, I'm not sharing any of the political views Heidegger has, but I think it's still valid to talk about um, his philosophy, which, which can be neatly separated from that. So, in kind of talking about ontology, um, Heidegger does a bunch of nifty tricks besides using language to make everything sound complicated. But um, what he what he's doing is saying, okay, the, the the being or the existence of a human is kind of special because humans can ask themselves or pose the question, okay, why is there something and why is there not nothing? So and then he tries to trace, okay, what makes the, the human existence so um, special? And um, his theory is that, well, what makes the human existence different is that we do not share the same being as a table. A table is just there, it doesn't, doesn't change or has the ability to change, whereas the human being is not being in that sense, but it's what he's calling Dasein, which means just something which is usually translated as being there. <clears throat> it means the human being is kind of thrown into the world, is always in the world already. It cannot kind of just detach and we can have that nice outside view um, and, and kind of investigate. And um, we, we are thrown into, into the world here and we are not complete. We're still having kind of that open part in, in our existence. We are lacking totality. And what that means is we're getting our meaning, so Heidegger, in the temporality of our being. So that sounds um, very complicated, but what he means is as we are having a future, what we are doing is we're projecting ourselves into the future. It's very ingrained in our uh, existence and our mode of existence that, that we are worrying about the future and that we are projecting ourselves in the future. And what he says is, okay, we're basically running ahead into death, with death being the final frontier, and then projecting ourselves back. So he actually tries to make a time reversal in a certain sense. And then that, that view that we're getting from our own future and embracing our own death that nobody can die for, so to speak, um, we are then taking decisions in the present. So our present is influenced by the future. And um, an example is, I'm going to have an exam on Friday that is in the future. I know that's going to happen, so I study today. So that's different. So one could say that's kind of a re reverse causality in a sense, as I'm kind of the future event is determining or, or kind of influencing what I'm doing um, today, namely studying and not, um, I don't know, having a beer with friends. Um, and, and this will be something that's particularly um, human. And then he also says, well, we have to basically embrace our death and, and feel that anxiety in order to, to have an authentic existence, in order to not just go with the flow, but actually um, um, embrace that, uh, that reverse causality and that, that we can make use of our um, possibilities that then open up all of a sudden. <clears throat> in that sense, our own past is also not just following us as a, as, a, as a tale, as we maybe think that about the past, uh, present, future timeline and the flow we are kind of used to from science, but it's actually ahead of us. It's kind of the, the, the burden that we're taking into our future because I haven't studied for my exam, which was last week, that's the burden I take ahead and that's kind of spoiling my future that I cannot graduate on time, for example. <clears throat> so, and this running ahead and then projecting back that kind of flip in time, that's what um, Heidegger calls ecstasis. And that's just the mode in our own existence that then would run um, counter to what we know from science, where it's kind of one event kind of leads to the other, and we have that um, only a causality going from um, the present to the future and not, um, not back. Okay, that kind of sounds like the complete reversal than um, what we just heard in science, but 
it is actually, as always, more complicated. So what I wanted to bring is, and here I start projecting again, is actually going back to measure times into something that calls Bayes' Bayes' theorem. Bayes was actually also a theologian and a reverend, and that is used, for example, in decision theory. And it's kind of has that it's the last formula. I promise has kind of that. Um, complicated uh, outset, but what that means is the probability of A occurring, probability of B occurring, okay? And then uh, here we have that conditional probability, probability of B occurring given A, and then what I'm getting out is probability of A given B. Okay, that's very abstract, but what does that mean? And I thought I'd bring an example. So for example, I'm with my kid in the park and of course kids do what they do. I lose the kid and do not know where it is. I know the last location where the kid was and as the time progresses, I'm less and less certain where uh, my kid actually ends up because I don't know if enough time has passed, the kid could be basically everywhere in the park or even beyond. So that's kind of, that would be my, my P, PA here. And then <clears throat> PAB, uh, P, BA, sorry, that's a typo here. That, the top one here is given that I have a vast idea where my kid might be, like one minute, it's gonna, that's how fast it can run and then it kind of progresses out. How likely am I to get new information? That just means if my kid is hiding in the bushes, I'm, it's a lot less likely that some other parent will kind of report and say, oh, I've, I've seen it, whereas when it's out on, the playground, for example, then um, it's very likely that, that it is seen. And then PB is the probability that I get new information. For example, someone tells me they have been seeing my kid heading in the direction of the playground. And then the PAB, kind of what I'm computing here, with that new information, I'm fairly certain that my kid will be at the playground in the near future, for example. That's how we compute it. Okay. The tricky part is here. Like in decision theory, what we're taking, we're taking causal action. What I do is I go ahead to the playground, although my kid might not have arrived there. In the present, I'm deciding, okay, I'm going from my location to the playground, whereas the information I got is my kid is heading to the playground. So I start my action in the present um, to head to the playground prior to that event actually happening that my kid is there as it's been seen being on the way there. So that's basically what, what um, Heidegger is doing and uh, kind of implementing that in a, in a new way. And we know that from decision theory, that's not like um, science where we say, okay, A happened, B happened, C happened. On the other hand, Bayes' theorem, that is something that's used in, I don't know, um, genome calculation, which genes are inherited and these things. So, so there is a direct um, connection here, um, and that can actually help us to, um, to illustrate. Okay, so where am I heading with all of this? Well, where am I, how am I getting back to um, theology actually in, in that discussion? So with kind of the measure time, and then I kind of looked into a Heidegger where it's kind of doing time reversal, I'm running ahead into death and then projecting myself back um, making a decision in the present, which is kind of like decision theory following Bayes' rule. <clears throat> I want to kind of look at, okay, one, one theologian um, on how that could be translated into theology. So one theologian that has done that is, of course, Wolfhard Pannenberg. And he has um, that nice article kind of in the metaphys metaphysics and the idea of God. So I claim he does not explicitly say that, but he was very much inspired by um, the Heideggerian view. And I'm pretty sure um, he didn't care too much about Bayes' theorem, but um, the, 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 the stark theory that Pannenberg leads with in, in chapter four is there that he says, well, God does not exist. That sounds more like Nietzsche than like Pannenberg, but what he means is like, well, for God to really exist, as being in our time, there would need to be um, the rule of God or, or God's kingdom, as that would be an integral part, not just a random attribute, but kind of part of the essence of the being of God. And well, look around, that's that's not actually what, what is here. So strictly speaking, God doesn't exist. Okay, 
But of course, Pannenberg is, is a theologian, so he does not rest the case there. What he means is, well, God exists in terms of not like now, but kind of like in the ecstasis, like Heidegger says, like in the future, and because God exists in the future, God even is the future as the ultimate frontier, it's kind of influencing us now in, in the present. <clears throat> So that means he's using that ecstasis concept and not placing kind of the ultimate frontier on my individual death, but taking a kind of bigger picture and saying, okay, I'm placing the futuri futurity in God and then making that backwards projection. And then of course we have um, Jesus as a pointer towards the future kingdom and the ecstatic um, future dimension, which, which allows us that running ahead and if we are following the rule of God in the presence, we're already establishing part of that rule of God and therefore also bringing God in a certain sense into um, existence. What that means is that um, Jesus would be kind of the, the information I'm getting already and kind of in a Bayesian sense, and then I'm taking that and shaping my actions accordingly in expectation what will be in the future and God will be the ultimate future. And um, what that also means is that the anxiety of death that Heidegger had would be kind of transferred into, into hope. <clears throat> so that, um, and in that sense, analogously, my past is not kind of the tail I'm dragging after me, but my past is kind of also projected into the future. Okay, so if we are going with what um, Pannenberg says here, you say, okay, yeah, that sounds all nice and logical, but of course, he opened the flank wide for um, criticism. Because what I think right away is, as that kind of works with space theorem and decision theory, completely. Um, secular in the world, uh, in the sense, or kind of contained in the world, could I then not say, well, the message of God is kind of a bit of fake news, and then I'm adjusting my behavior in according to that and projecting myself out. That's just the information I have at the moment that might or might not be true. And then I'm projecting myself out, I'm altering my decision so there is an effect. But that doesn't mean there's actually a corollary um, to that. So that would be kind of a classical Marxian um, religion would just be uh, the opium, opium for the people. So in that sense, so, so that is certainly a response that, that uh, Pannenberg is, is, is kind of leaving that flank open. In his sense, what, what he says is, the, the true assumption that, that atheisms are, are getting wrong is that the world and the human existence can be explained entirely self-contingently without a divine figure, kind of like what I just did. And then, um, or, or and, that the theological, theological perspective doesn't add any value or um, to that explanation of the human existence um, in that sense. So if we are saying, okay, in our actions that are inspired from the futurity, we're actually bringing about the existence of God as ruled by, by, the, by the kingdom of God or the, or the rule of God. Um, what is the extra we are gaining here? What, what is the extra that, that, that theological perspective is um, offering? And Pannenberg argues, and I don't fully agree, but just to give you that, that it's actually that break from determinism. He says there is that, that power of God identified as love conveniently. And then um, that's providing the unity of our action and then following or being inspired by, um, by Whitehead. That would be then the way to break away from purely causal chain of determinism itself. So, and then Pannenberg himself argues with kind of the Copenhagen uh, interpretation uh, on the quantum level. And we talked a bit about that. First of all, I think as I've showed the, the Copenhagen interpretation, it's not 
unparalleled. There are other other competing interpretations that are also in agreement with with the data. Also predicting kind of the um, not being able to predict in kind of um, uh, on a single entity does not throw out uh, ensemble theory. So I think he's just going um, astray there in, in that interpretation. So what I want to, to pose here as a conclusion, so to speak, is we have looked at time in kind of the, the natural science, we've seen the, the jumper that we see, okay, there's a flow, and there's a call causal connection. <clears throat> and then after we heard what, what Heidegger is doing, we kind of looked at, okay, decision theory or, um, that, that we're using engineering using Bayes' rule is actually similar to that. It's not a completely unknown concept that, the, that kind of projecting forward with uncertainty and then taking a decision here. So if we want to have a, a benefit in kind of a theology, like um, Pannenberg, we have to show, okay, there is an extra that theology actually brings, and not, not just opioid for the, for the people or information that might be wrong. So, but what that comparison with the um, science and Bayes theorem can offer is that we actually have to make the same jump. That we have the one, okay, we have that timeline past, present, future, that is the same as we have in science, we measure that with, with change. And then we have the optimization of a system where we're using Bayes' theorem, that I have a sensor, for example, that needs to look in a certain direction or kind of that example of the kid search in the park. But there is a riff there, right? One is kind of, okay, what, what, is, what is the natural, um, natural science? And then the other one is, okay, what are we doing in the optimization of a human designed system, <clears throat> kind of like the search in the park. And Pannenberg is actually running up, up against the same wall here, is kind of harvesting what he Heidegger has done, um, and then placing the ultimate frontier, not at death, but at God, which makes a lot of sense and would be in agreement with, with uh, what, we, uh, what we know from um, our tradition, for example. However, he has to make the same, same jump here. How do you bridge the gap? That brings me to the end of my talk, and I'm not offering a solution here, as you maybe have hoped, but um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, in a good philosophical tradition, not answering the question, but making the question clearer. And I hope that um, was accomplished, and I'm open for questions. Thanks, Carolyn. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Okay, the floor is open. Um, if you've written questions in chat, Carolyn, do you want to field those? Um, I'm just trying to see. I'm, I'm not seeing them at the moment. So if you can. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, there's one from Brain Mohawk. Um, your use of infinitely smaller pieces of time makes me wonder about how mathematical infinity fits into this understanding of the paradox. If there are an infinite number of points between X and Y, does that exacerbate the problem or does it give you a greater number of measuring points to the reality of the movement? Yeah, um, that is of course um, a great um, question. <laughs> I mean, I think what I've, I've shown is you're reversing the problem, like the, the infinitely small and kind of going to infinity are always connected. And, and you can even show that with, uh, with the final limit theorem. Um, and I think it doesn't really help. I mean, that, that's kind of the, the, um, the other of Zeno's paradoxes, which is also not solved that you always go to the half distance and how do you ever make the, make the full um, distance? Um, so yeah, great question. Do not have an answer other than you can actually compute it, but doesn't mean that we can actually explain philosophically what's happening, which, which is kind of the, the, the really interesting part for me. Okay, and then there's Joseph who said, uh, I think I might see where Panberg was trying to go. It's not that God doesn't exist, rather God is timeless and insofar that God has no form, shape, mass, or even any observable activity that forms the basis of time, 
or as a result of his timelessness, God is extant only through and around structured time. Um, yeah, great. Um, that is actually getting to the to the core of things. Does, does God have duration in that sense? And um, I think Pannenberg would kind of support something like a coexistence, but not like in a sense that full existence is is reached. So um, so I think Joseph, you're going going to the core of the of the problem there. In his article, he really goes so far to say, well, God doesn't exist in our time doesn't mean that god doesn't exist in god's time so to, so to speak and then we have to think about what that what that means so um he makes a subtle distinction there with the existence in our time which which i think saves him here okay and then i have for a card-carrying Bayesian, it's wrong to ever hold beliefs with an absolute certainty. Yes. Um, one is always adjusting one's credence based on the available evidence. I want to ask Pannenberg if this theology required in introducing the debatability of God into the doctrine of God. And he said emphatically, no. Oh, that's surprising. Um, uh, what's your own thought about divine debatability as an eternal Christian theological concern. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm a bit surprised by Pannenberg's answer. I thought he would actually go that that, that is, is necessary. I think I would actually shift it and say, okay, debatability in the terms of observability. And there we get into, yeah, there has to be a certain element of revelation in there in order to generate the information in a Bayesian sense that, that we can that we can um, act upon. So I, I would go go with yes, that is certainly certainly a concern, especially if we want to go the, the Bayesian route, which I think um, has uh, has some advantages to it. There's one from Kirk, do you if you see it? <clears throat> Above the bottom. Okay, and then there was kind of the follow-up. Yeah, so revelation is also a problem. Um, <laughs> um, if there was complete revelation, it would resolve the problem. However, we know that that's not the case. So um, I would say it's just part of, um, we need revelation in order to have faith. That's, that's how far I would go. And then Carlos Bovell asks, uh, I'm not clear as to what gap we are trying to bridge. One between causal chain of physical motion, a chain that cannot be broken, and the subjective experience of human choice, or are we in trying to make room for God to act in time and space? <clears throat> That's a very good question. So um, I think the making room for God to act in time and space, if we are projecting that back on our action in the presence, that would actually, we would have made room for that. That would not mean God can just do um, whatever she wants and, and interact in that sense, but it would be kind of the indirect bringing God in the existence in our time through adjusting the action. That would what Pannenberg would support. So I would say it's not about making room, I think, there we can argue that might or might not be have accomplished. I think the gap I wanted to identify is, yes, we have the cause, causal chain of events, and then um, we have the human adjustment of actions. And then how, how do they actually go together? Um, and then um, what I'm trying to say is that that is actually not foreign to the mathematical frameworks that we're using actually. And, and that that parallel um, can maybe help to address both. So if we have a solution in one, maybe um, we can directly use that as a solution in, in the other as well. So it's the, the first kind of the gap between the causal chain and being the originator of causal events as in terms of making changes to my own actions. Okay, I think those are all the questions in the chat I'm seeing.
Hey, let me let me raise a question. Thank you, Carol. That was wonderful. I, I got so much out of it. But I wanted to ask you about um, Heidegger in relation to Pannenberg. Um, I think Heidegger thinks about anticipation in the ordinary sense, like I'm thinking about what I'll do tonight. And he said, of course, the ultimate object is death. And so that, that influences the present. And in, as you say, in a, in a sense, that's the future influencing the present. But to be a little more careful, it's the future in the present influencing the present in the present. Now, there's no doubt that there is going to be death. So I'm not saying it's an illusion, but it's not my actual death as a present fact influencing me in the present because I'm still here. Hello. <laughs> right. So it's more like what Augustine meant by, by mind that, you know, our, we're aware of, we remember the past, even though it's irretrievable, and we anticipate the future, even though it's not yet, never can be yet. The future can never be present in the present. Whereas for, for Pannenberg, I think, and I want, that's what I want to ask you, I think he differs from Heidegger because for Pannenberg, the notion of prolepsis in which the future is anticipated in the present is actually a radically new future. It's the transformed creation into new creation, eschaton, embodied in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. right? And it's that reality that is present in the new creation. Is that reality actually in our present? And so it's not just an anticipation like we think about it, but it's a manifestation. So in my view, at least, and I want to hear what you, th you think, mm -hmm. I think Pannenberg has a much richer view of the problem of the future in the present than Heidegger does. So, so what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree that that, that is the, the, the reality or the existence of God manifest in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think um, one could argue against that and say, okay, this is only, is that really a reality that's manifest or is that something that we make up just going with, with the Marxian criticism there? Sure. I think Pannenberg surely means the other, that, that mm -hmm. the reality of God manifest as, as something separate than our projection. And, and that would be kind of the extra he's, he's, he's adding or that, that is not contained in just a contingent um, worldview with, without that dimension. On the other hand, my question for him would be how distinguishable would that be um, from, from just my projection in a Bayesian sense, that's the information I have and I'm kind of projecting out for myself and, and the classical ecstasis. Right. So yeah, I think, yeah, he, he has a much richer um, understanding there brings us back to, to kind of Kirk's question about the observability, detectability, um, and debatability. How can you actually, as being in the world, distinguish between the two? Well, that's that's great response. Thank you. I think um, Pannenberg's conversion experience was so radical for him. I mean, after all, think, think of his culture and time and everything else, and he was truly converted uh, by a, a ecstatic experience. I think that gave him the concept of a, a proleptic future actually in the present. It, what, yes, of course, he, you know, Freud could say it's a projection of his own mortality, but I really think Pannenberg took that to be an objective event in the sense that it, it wasn't him formulating it or creating it, it was created in him. And the only concept he had to describe that was God's presence. So I, I, I do want to say, I mean, I think Pannenberg argued pretty well against the reductionists, but I think he he thought that way because of his experience as a young guy. Mm -hmm. So that that's why I like his notion of prolepsis as a manifestation in the present of the eschatological future, not just of what ha will happen twenty years from now when I die. <laughs> yes, and and of course you pick that up in your own theology and yeah. develop that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, folks. Anything else? I would just like to also project my thank you slide. Sure. Thanks, of course, to uh, Bob Russell, Ted Peters, and then also for the theology education by Scott McDougall, help from Carl DeMars, and then also for um, all my classmates in, in, in the class, uh, uh, Hong Jung Lee, Chen In Song, Dong Yu Hin, Hermino Nadalescu, Kelly Miller Sanchez, Emil Yuban, Carissa Yaga Sanders, Yasol Lee, Luang Mayo, and Su Yong Ho Yo. 
because I think that all contributed to this talk. Terrific. And I'll, before I close, I'll just remind us all that in two months, uh, the G2 will celebrate my 40th year here, can you imagine, uh, and my retirement uh, with an event on May 19th, 5 to 7 p.m., a hybrid event. You can, you can come and taste the treats, or you can uh, stay at home and bring your own. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing you. And if you, you can find um, material on it in on the G2 website under the CTNS page under uh, coming events or future events and on the CTNS website. So let, I'm gonna close by quoting Joseph. Uh, Scott said, what an excellent talk tonight. And Joseph said, what a, a great presentation. And Carmen said, great presentation as well. Many said that. So on behalf of all of them, thank you, Carmen, Carolyn, for an absolutely great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, good night, everyone. <laughs>